Hello and welcome to the Squeaky Bum Time podcast presented exclusively on a Chop Sports channel of the Premier Streaming Network. We are recording this on Monday, May 8th, 8th, 8th. I am your host, Laurent Cortines. In this episode, Arsenal show their medal up north versus Newcastle. United stumble in the east of London and City roll on. But first, this Monday we had a relegation Royal Rumble on Coronation Weekend. Unbelievable stuff. And we will get to it right after this. Please like, share, and subscribe. Please like, share, and subscribe. It means everything to us. We need every single person to be a part of the show. If you don't know anyone, please tell them about it. If someone doesn't know about Premier League football, this is the podcast for them. Now let's get to it. The relegation Royal Rumble. Okay, so if you don't know, we coronated the great and powerful Charles III to be king this weekend, and that affected fixtures. We didn't have an early fixture, so God save the king uh, if, if you're into that sort of thing. But more importantly, we had three relegation battles this Monday, setting the record for goals in a, rele- a three-game match week, and the scores looked like this. First, Fulham, five, Leicester City, three, Everton, five, Brighton, one, and then Forest, four, Southampton, three. That's 10, 14, uh, 21 goals in only three games. That's seven goals a game. That shit's not normal. So crazy, crazy stuff. And we'll start, for me, we will start with Christian's wonderful Forest they win 4-3. This was the game they had to had to have. It started early and beautiful for them. Taiwo Owani sitting in the middle of the goal. Of course, on the break, Brendan Johnson running down the wing, gets it to Owani. He puts it in early uh, on 18. The second one comes a little bit later. Very similar, a bit more. Comes down the other side this time. Gibbs White scuffs one, drops to Iwani. He rolls his man standing in the middle of the box where goal scored and goal scorers score goals. He hits it top bins and Forrest are flying. We played Mull of Kintar just for everyone else to play. Uh, John, John Santana, for some reason, thought it's not a good song. It's weird that they still sing it. I don't get it. It doesn't feel soccery, but Forrest sing it because in 77, they won the league and won the league cup. And then the next season, they won the European cup all against Liverpool, all the tricky Brian Clough. Again, we can't talk about Forrest enough because of the great and powerful power Brian Clough and everything they meant. Not only that, we had Martin O'Neill on Sunday Night Football on Sky, one of the most important players of that Forrest team, talking with Carragher, representing Forrest. Just cool to have him on. He's soft-spoken, very kind man. Martin O'Neill has managed in the Premier League many, many clubs, many, many seasons. I believe last of Sunderland. I know he had a, a good run at Aston Villa as well. Martin O'Neill, also Ireland, but uh, class stuff to have him on. Then, as is one to do for Forrest and teams at the bottom, they can't defend. They don't know what they're doing. Ball lost in the midfield. Bing, bang, boom. Uh, of course, everything that's good that happens for Southampton, James Ward Prowse is involved. He hands it off to Al Caraz who goes in goal. It's 2-1. This game's bonkers. So from 18 to 25, we've got goals. We've got goals. Wow. E wow. Uh, Morgan Gibbs white, probably Forrest's best player. Uh, he, he puts away a penalty on 44. So we go into the half forest feeling. Okay. They're up three, one. They feel okay. You're like, all right, forest, you got this. You're okay. Not so fast. My friend, Of course, the bugaboo, again, James Ward-Prowse on the corner, puts the ball right where it should be. Lianko smashes it home, and it's 3-2, and we have a game again, and it feels scary. Why aren't we scared? We should be scared. And of course, again, Morgan Gibbs-White with the assist on this one. He pirouettes in the box on the break to Danilo, who finishes it. Forrest up, 4-3, 4-2. You think they're doing fine. You think everything's okay. Not so fast, my friend. Uh, With nine minutes of stoppage time, a penalty 
to Southampton. Again, James Ward-Prowse, who assisted on the cross, drew the penalty. He was involved in every goal, puts away the penalty, and it ends 4-3. But let me tell you, and I know it because I watched it, and we could feel it on our reporter on the ground, man on the ground, Christian, at the city ground. This game was nervy, very nervy. Uh, Forest, again, win their games at home, on the road, they have a problem, but this was the game they had to have. They're on 33, a full three points ahead of the relegation zone. They do have the worst goal difference, but they give themselves a little room. They won the game they needed to win. Um, I think Southampton played some good stuff. Yeah, they were behind most of the game, but I thought they created chances. And, you know, none of these teams in the bottom are good. They're all problematic. They all have issues. They all run into problems. But Southampton, I think we know now, are definitely going down. They're on 24. They're six points away from sniffing anything. They're really gone. There's only three games to go, six points. You do the math. They really can't get out of their own way. And Forrest live and give themselves another chance to try and get out of this relegation zone. They sit on 35 with a minus 33, but our friends continue, and we're going to go to our next upset, our next five and six goal thriller to our friends in the South Coast. We swoop on to uh, Brighton, my, my second home, Brighton, flying high, Brighton trying to get those games in hand so that they can find a European place, finish in six, maybe get a nice Europa League spot. Not so fast, my friend. Everton came and they brought the fucking ruckus like it was the Wu-Tang and they were all dirty bastard. Bring the motherfucking ruckus. They did it. And in the first minute, Abdele Decore scores a goal on an amazing spin by Dominic Calvert-Lewin. Just all class. Maybe that wasn't the first one. I think... I can't even remember now, but turned over very early in the game. Spins. DeCorey was everywhere. He was running everywhere, scores the first goal, and you're like, oh, shit. I guess Everton are going to win this game. Then even more DeCorey. He bursts into the box again on the break. He is running on his own like a madman. No one picks him up. On the volley, he smashes his home. This was not an easy skill. The second goal from DeCorey is better than the first. The first one was all Calvert-Lewin on the spin, leaves Dunk in the dust. The second one is just a breakaway, and DeCorey busts his ass to get downfield, gets onto the cross from McNeil, who was absolutely fantastic, and we'll hear his name a little bit longer. But it, they weren't done yet. On 35, McNeil gets some space by the byline. He smashes a cross across to who else was running to make that cross. DeCorey was at the back post. And Jason Steele deflects it into his own goal. Brighton are down 3-0. And I immediately thought, don't fuck with Brighton. They're really good. And they are going to come back in this game. So the half comes sooner enough for Brighton. Deserby's like, you know what? Fuck you guys. He pulls four players off. And he's like, we're going to go win this goddamn game. And the first 20 minutes of the second half were legit. Buonanotte, Undav, Welbeck, and Webster all came off to be replaced by Enciso, Gilmore, and Ferguson. And also Levi Caldwell comes in for defense, and it gets crazier. Oh, actually, did I get that wrong? No, Solly Marsh, I believe, comes in um, instead of Caldwell. I'm not sure. Anyway, but Marsh was on uh, as one of the four. And Brighton put Everton under serious, serious pressure. Uh, I don't have the, I only have the full match stats, not the in-game stats, but um, Brighton took 23 shots and I would say 15 of those came early in the second half. It it opened up on the wing for Solly Marsh and he was just pounding balls into the box, pounding balls into the box. But there was a new friend in town for the great and powerful Everton and it was Yerry Mina. Out is the shit heel that is Michael Caine, I, Michael Keane. Once I knew he wasn't in the lineup, I thought Everton had a chance. Also, Holgate was out, and young, um, what's his name for Everton? Young Patterson played fullback, taking the place of injured captain Seamus Coleman, and it made a difference. I thought Everton's defense was much better. Uh, it seems like Dyche is finding his guys. He took time. I guess he trusted Keane at first, and now he's like, you know what, Keane, you're done. 
Uh, McNeil was fantastic in this game. And as Brighton continued to push and continued to push, McNeil had his chances. He scores on 76 and then another on 90 and six. The 76 goal, he rolls in. He puts it, he celebrates before the goal goes in. They get around. And on the break, Everton were just incredible. Uh, Brighton, to their credit, they played like Brighton in the second half, but that first half, the damage was done. The three goals go through. They are not quite ready to make it a European push. They just could not match Everton's fight. They could not match Everton's passion. This was an away game for Everton. Those who Evertonians, you know, Everton have been awful away from home, but they traveled really well. Um, the Amex, let's be fair to Brighton, it's not a hotbed of football. They have passionate fans, but it's not like a cauldron or anything. Plus, it's a new stadium. So Everton brought their energy all the way down from the northeast, the northwest, excuse me, all the way from Liverpool to, Lund to, to the south coast, traveling well, really loud. You could hear them singing, Everton, uh, and they really put it to Brighton. Um, incredible work. Uh, young Patterson really checked Matoma. Matoma sort of had one goal. Uh, they did pull one back that he banked off McAllister as they were falling into the goal. And of course, our man Pickford and his short arms and his jumpy, yelly self, our yippy little uh, Jack Terrier of a goalkeeper is flopping around like a, like a Jack Terrier catching a bounced ball off the floor. He was incredible again. And they really just pulled it out. They really pulled it out, did four saves couple of balls off the post to be fair for Brighton this game could have been different I was saying as the chat went on as we were watching it as a group you know if Brighton had gotten a goal within the first 10 minutes of the second half I think things are different but they kind of ran their impetus ran out they had energy but they couldn't sustain 20 minutes of pure attack where they were putting Everton under the cosh standout performers Tarkovsky always Mina always just magnets on their head clearing every cross Everything that Sully Marsh tried to do to get free, he just couldn't. Matoma on the other side was checked well by Patterson. And Everton get a 5-1 win out of this one. Incredible stuff. Just fantastic stuff from them. Um, I don't think anyone really wants Everton to go down. I don't think it's the kind of club that anyone really wants to go down, right? They're too historic. It would really be bad for the Premier League and bad for Everton. They really need this game. Uh, after I go, I'll go one more game and then we'll talk about the cool amazingness of the relegation battle. Uh, the last game was the uh, in London Leicester go to Fulham and just get the doors blown off them. Um, it's 5-1 into the second half on, on 70. Uh, Leicester do fight back, score two late goals, make it look more respectable. But 5-3 does not do any of this justice. Um, Lester just still really bad defensively. I got to call out Vout Feiss. This dude just is seems to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I know when he came in, he was solidifying of the defense, but every single move he make, it seemed to be a mistake. On the first goal, sorry, on the Venetius goal, he comes out. Venetius runs in behind. Nobody fills in the space. Uh, the Villian goal, the first goal was a fluke, just a cross that no one got. That was on Iverson. So that's two goals that are kind of mistakes. Better defensive teams handle. Um, Kearney just gets free on two different ones. They don't close anyone down. He's in the box firing goals in. And then Villian's is just a thunder cunt on 70 that he fires in. Harvey Barnes uh, put one in, put two in, but it really didn't make a difference. Lester... They're not good defensively, and I get that they have to be open and try and outscore team, outscore team. So maybe this 5-3 is a result of them trying to fight, but you've got to show some defensive level. Uh, I'm looking at the midfield. Tielemans, dude, we, I know you want to attack, but you've got to show something. Um, Tielemans and Soari both get yanked in this game because they were bad, and they really didn't do enough. Um, Somare has been actually one of the poster boys for the bad purchases that um, that Rogers has made. He never really settled in, and he, it was his fault that this game really couldn't hold on to anything. And then Faust and Sayenchu sort of getting shown up. Uh, not a great performance by Leicester, a team in the relegation battle. You can't give up five goals, especially mistakes. Uh, they need to sit tighter, but maybe they just don't think they can defend, and they're going to just go forward. I don't know. 
But this was an exciting game. I mean, Fulham are really off the schneid again, back scoring goals, black playing well. They had been in really poor form, especially no Mitrovic since the bump with the with the um with the officials and whatever. So that was the relegation royal rumble. Um, and I do want to give a little bit of a I know I normally do these the other way around, but I do want to talk about the relegation um concept within the concept of American sports and whatever. Uh, I know it's fun to talk about, um, especially this week. It was also the last day in the championship. Heartbreak for Millwall, who didn't get into the playoffs. Sunderland's joy, though, they are in the playoffs, along with Luton, Coventry, uh, up up the specials, up the two-tone for Coventry, and Terry Neville, who, was, who died this year. Um, Terry, Terry Hall, excuse me, easy. I said Gary Neville. Terry Hall of the specials. Um, who else is coming up? It's Luton. Uh, sorry, in the playoffs. Luton, Middlesbrough, Coventry, um, Sunderland, and one other team is in the playoffs. Oh, no, that's four. Yeah, that's four. That's four. Those are the four. Right. Luton, Middlesbrough, Coventry, and Sunderland all in the playoffs to be the last team that makes it to the Premier League. As we already know, Sheffield and Burnley are returning to the Premier League. Anyway, so that's promotion. That's relegation. Those are the teams going up and down. Um, it gives a level of dynamism to a season, to a sport that we don't have in the U.S. We have tanking. We have teams giving up. Um, it, it has a it's, – it's looked on romantically by Americans in our football, and it's looked on longingly by American fans – especially we, with, with Wrexham. But I think we're focused very often on the rise part and not on the fall. Um, going down is terrible. And it's heartbreaking. And just the crack in my voice, even just thinking about it, when your team is at the bottom and they're near relegation, it can feel like the death of a pet, like a dog's death. Uh, and a whole community feeling it at the same time can really bring something down and if you watch Sunderland till I die I think they really capture it really well it's a good documentary on Netflix there's two seasons you don't need two seasons worth just one season just to get the sense of what the town means what the team means and how their week to week is connected to the club and to have the team have hope and belief and have it shatter and and have it sort of fall out from under them and have the team go down it is sad and dark um, and there's such stakes on these games, levels of money and revenue that are unknown in American sports. You know, it would be like if an NFL team was just like, okay, when the season starts, you're guaranteed 200 million in television revenue. If you get relegated, that money is going to disappear in three seasons. Oh, and getting out, you have to win your way back in. So this idea of money changing and contracts getting cut and players contracts. So there are players on your team that if they get relegated, their contract says they they're automatically free agents or they get automatic pay cuts. So it's really intense. It's not for the faint hearted. We as Americans really like pro rel from the romance side, from the going up side, but we do not handle the, going downside. So it's a really tough thing to really think about. Uh, and let's get to the rest of the matches and talk about Manchester United. Uh, I talked about Manchester United. I really meant to say, I want to talk about Arsenal. Uh, they had the biggest game of our non-relegation Royal Rumble. They went up to Newcastle and were able to withstand a real, real battle between two really good teams. First 10 minutes, Newcastle were all over Arsenal. They hit the post uh, from, um, from Jacob Murphy, the venerable, now legendary Jacob Murphy, who uh, really has done a good job with the team. He does hit the post early, but those first 10 minutes, it was loud. Uh, Gumaresh had a shot block. They, they went off target. Like I said, Murphy hit the woodwork. Isaac had a shot block. And then... Out of a little bit of nothing and a little bit of weathering the storm, a little bit of a gut punch, a little bit of a sucker punch, the quality of Arsenal does come through. Odegaard, 
from pretty far out, probably 20 yards out, really low and hard, bottom corner. Arsenal get the goal. That settles them down for sure. There was a penalty shout early that it looked like VAR called it off. And so momentum had gone Arsenal's way. And then from when Odegaard got the goal, Arsenal really controlled the game a lot more. The next 10 minutes after that were really in their hands before Willock had one saved. And then a little bit better in the second half from uh, Isak. He hits the woodwork. Shar has one saved right next to each other, right on 48, 49. And then from there, Arsenal are able to control the game. I think the key players in this game were, um, were our man, Jorginho. Just this was the right game for him. This was a change from the regular Arteta team. Partey was left out. Uh, Kiwar was brought in, a new defenseman, instead of holding. I think those changes gave Arsenal a bit more control. And after they were able to withstand that big, hard, hardy uh, Newcastle attack, and get their two goals, both from, wait a minute, where's the second goal? There was definitely two goals. <laughs> I don't know why the second goal isn't listed here. Um, oh, it's an own goal by Cher. Sorry, on 71, I had forgotten about that. Uh, they get the two goals, then they're able to really calm the game down. But, you know, this was a professional performance. This was a grown-up performance. This was a performance by Arsenal that – They needed and they had to have, and I think they can hang their hat on this performance as the type of game that they can build on and go forward with. They had the blip. I don't think it was that bad. You know, you can argue about the Southampton game and the West Ham game. They were never in it against City. City were way, way, way too good. You can argue about the the Liverpool game. It was at Anfield. But this is more, to be frank, this is more Arsenal's level. They are about as good as Newcastle. Versus being as good as City. There's no one as good as City. The fact that Liverpool matched City those seasons literally broke them. Uh, City are just a class above in a different stratosphere of talent. There's not a bad player on City. One player comes out, another comes in. I recognize that. But with uh, Arsenal playing in St. James's Park, you got the sense this was two teams that could go at it, uh, that 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 had a way to play that each wanted to do certain things and Arsenal's play between Jorginho and Odegaard and class was able to get past Newcastle's power pace and grit. And this game did get chippy. There were a lot of fouls. There was a lot of sort of fisticuffs. Xhaka almost lost it, but then was able to calm down. was actually the best defensive player that, um, that Arsenal had. He blocked a key shot. Uh, in the box that he tracked back on. So really, really good stuff. And a, a hair on your chest performance from Arsenal that they think that I think that they can carry on. And I think, you know, as I look at the XG here, even 1.3 to each, but Arsenal do get the two goals. So more clinical, more class, just a little, a smidge better than Newcastle. But Newcastle are really, really good. They're probably nailed down for the top four now as it starts to open up. And now... We go talk about Manchester United, who do now lose two games on the bounce after the heartbreak of the penalty uh, by McAllister McAllister and Brighton in midweek. Now they go to West Ham and they have De Gea, just one of his mistakes that he makes four times a year. He just yaks one. And um, uh, Ben Rama broke through, uh, takes the shot. He's surrounded by three players. He just tries to get a harmless shot off. And De Gea hits his hand, and he doesn't save it. And it goes in. Um, From there, it did not really feel like um, United created much. They've been having this problem. Uh, Even within this game, the XG was on West Ham's favor. They did get the goal, but nothing really changed for United. They could not get anything created um, in this game. Just not enough not enough opportunity. Bruno made chances and Marcus Rashford had a few chance creations there, especially early on, just nothing on target. Although Rashford did hit the woodwork uh, on a, on a speculative shot, a lot of stuff just off target, unable to get things on goal, unable to pressure the West Ham goal and just lots of wayward shots, took a lot of shots, created a lot of shots, but nothing that, 
really tested Fabianski too much. Uh, he's been a good goalkeeper for a long time. And, um, you know, just unable to get the goal they needed. And now where they were six points ahead of Liverpool um, for the top four, that's now down to three points with um, having played one less game. Or is it one? How is that? Is that? Am I, do I have that right? Yep. No, sorry. It's one point. Liverpool have a game in hand. United just needed one win. They did the worst thing they could possibly do. And Liverpool, we'll segue right into them. Liverpool have been now getting clean sheets, getting their wins. They won uh, one nil uh, versus Brentford at home, as you'd expect. Not too crazy. I mean, they did create a lot. Salah gets his goal, 30 for the season. Fabinho with the incredible pass over to Van Dijk, who heads it across to Salah, who bundles it in. But this was a, another strong performance from uh, the new look uh, Liverpool. Um, regular regular players. Fabinho seems to be getting his legs. Gakpo played in the midfield this time. So they're still trying things, maybe as a number 10, kind of in a three with Jones and Fabinho. I guess they knew... I guess they knew that Brentford would sort of sit deep. So I guess they could, they felt good about, you know, trying to play this different way, but Liverpool controlled this game from end to end. We're really never in trouble. They didn't give up shit to Brentford. Uh, so they're in very, very good shape and they just keep plugging away. And there they are pushing themselves. I think this was the push that they thought they'd get to. Um, and now it is actually happening for Liverpool, they've won, I believe it's six on the bounce. Is that right? Since April 1st with three draws. Come on. The two draws, Chelsea and Arsenal. And then one, two, three, four, five, six wins in a row. Um, clean sheets, the last two, two one nils, the last two games, uh, both home against Fulham and Brentford. Good teams, but not great teams that you'd expect to, to, to really – uh, trouble them. I think the the Spurs game was probably the big one that they got a nice break in. Um, you know, getting pulling pulling it back against Forest was also a good one. So they're really humming now, scoring goals, which is secretly one of their problems. But then you know, getting getting Trent Alexander Arnold on the ball and able to create for them has made a huge difference. And Liverpool are now just one point out of the top four where United season is starting to peter out. Uh, I worry for them. Um, I know they're going to have a bad taste in their mouth if this season ends without them being in the top four. United should be in the top four. They are our top four side. But if you look at it in terms of goal difference, in terms of underlying numbers, they have been playing with fire all season. Based on goal uh, expected goals, the top four are City, Arsenal, United, I mean, Newcastle, Brighton, Liverpool, then United. So the top six, sorry. Yeah, the top six in, in expected goals are City, Arsenal, Newcastle, Brighton, Liverpool, then United, then Tottenham. So it's not that far off, but Brighton are the, are the sort of party poopers that were just like, wow, why is that team doing there? Uh, they've been outperforming their numbers all season. Uh, actually, probably have lost games that they shouldn't have. Um, but United have been pulling shit out of their ass all season, and it's starting to show up again. You can see it in their expected goals. They have scored fewer than they would have expected, and that is indicative of a team without a striker, without a good striker. Good teams with good strikers score more than you'd expect. Bad teams with bad strikers score less, and that's what's happened with United. Once uh, Rashford was on his run of form and then got hurt. They've been unable to reclaim that consistent goal scoring that they had in the middle of the season when they were pulling games out and Rashford was unstoppable. Those goals have dried up and nobody has been able to come in and replace those goals. Uh, Bruno Fernandes is still creating shots. He's still creating lots. Uh, I looked at the stats the other day. He's in the top five of expected assists, but not in the top five of assists. So he's created a lot more opportunities than players have finished for him. So he should be much better off than he is. And um, he's still a creative force. But man, if they got Harry Kane, that's the man they should get. I'm not a United fan. I don't want United to win. I don't want United to be anywhere 
near the team or near good or near anything. But United with Harry Kane would would feel like 2013, uh, 2013 Van Persie going to United, 2012 Van Persie going to United where they're there, they're close. Well, actually, I don't think they would win the league necessarily, but having a real striker who gets in good positions and gets on the ball would be amazing. So just that XG assist thing for Fernandez, his X assists, expected assisted goals, is 14.6, and he only has seven. That's seven passes that should have been goals that weren't. Can you imagine? United with seven more goals is probably two more wins, at least. And two more wins would put them solidly in the top four. And right now, they're sitting on 63, having played 34, with Liverpool right behind them on 62, having played 35, but a vast difference in goal difference that plus eight and plus seven against them, plus the head-to-head uh, makes a huge difference. Liverpool on their tail, ready to claim the spot that you would expect, the spot that you would expect. Another difference is Allison has been the best keeper in the Premier League for the past two seasons, and he does not give away games. He may give away a pass here and there, unlike Ederson, uh, but he does stops every one-on-one. He's the number one one-on-one saving keeper in the league, and he's plus 10 on expected goals saved. So that's like two games right there just from Allison, whereas Dave just blew one. So a lot of things heading Liverpool's way in this run-in that we see coming down the pipe. What other games of note? Manchester City, two, leads one. City completely dominate Big Sam's debut back in the Premier League. Two goals that are almost identical from Ilkay Gundogan on 19 and 27. Put this game out of reach early, but then City just had a had one of those games where another day when they didn't have the two goals, they would have lost or, or drew because Holland hit the post like four times. <laughs> it was a little ridiculous. It was a little unfortunate. City were just getting through all the time. Um, Ilkay Gundogan set the record for touches in a game. He had 190 touches he was just on the ball the whole game pass completion 192 percent on 170 on 184 passes so Ilkay Gundogan just master class of this game City had four players with over 100 touches almost a thousand touches in this game Leeds were just not there uh not a great defensive team at all possession stats 80 20 not great for Leeds but Leeds were in fact in this game they got a goal late from Rodrigo on a, on a turnover and a mistake. And for a minute there, you thought Leeds might do a smash and grab, just as you'd expect the great and powerful uh, Sam Allardyce to do. He's unable to do that. And this is a, a warning sign for, um, for City. They cannot be complacent to make mistakes and give up goals like that. These are the types of goals that in a Champions League, which City play on Tuesday – against the great and powerful Real Madrid at the Bernabeu. Uh, I'm not ready for that game. Uh, City can't make these mistakes. They can't give away goals. Right now, City are not um, holding clean sheets very often. Uh, It's not their best defensive season. Uh, I think that's mostly down to Ederson. Ederson is is a minus on uh, unexpected saves. But, of course, City are on now unbeaten in 19 unbeaten in 20 something something absurd like that they're on a unbeaten since february 5th their last loss was to tottenham 1-0 um uh they are unbeaten in 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Oh, there it is. Unbeaten in 20. Uh, they had that draw versus Bayern Munich. Um, oh, that's that's in all competitions, unbeaten in 20. In the Premier League, I believe they're on a 10-game winning streak, uh, but I will count it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yes, 1, 10 have not lost again since that Tottenham game in February. So 14 unbeaten. Just put the, put the pedal down and just took off. Uh, they had done this... They don't do it at the same time every year, but they're invariably with City under Pep is a moment that everything comes together. They put the gas down and they just go. Uh, happened in the Diaz season 
um, at around November, December time. And this season has happened in January, really. I think the, the, the Tottenham loss was really hurtful and they just were like, you know what? Fuck you people. And they were gone. They just disappeared. Uh, actually the, the, the Nottingham Forest draw was really brutal, but since then they've been imperious, but not a lot of clean sheets, just the three. Uh, against Newcastle, Palace, and West Ham. So City do have to clean that up. Uh, Ake looks like he's going to miss the game. So a little bit of trouble there. But the Real Madrid game is our season. Um, and then after that is Everton, then Real Madrid at home uh, to seal the potential trouble. <laughs> uh, I'm nervous, I think. Am I? Nah, not really. Uh, Holland did not score. The big controversy in this game, of course, was... Um, more rich people problems. Oh, we're fighting about who takes penalties. So in the game, uh, a penalty is drawn. Uh, Holland picks up the ball. Ilkay Gundogan's on two. He hands the ball to Gundogan. So Erling Holland is the penalty taker. City are only up two. He hands the ball to Gundogan. Gundogan misses the penalty. On the sideline, we capture Pep yelling, you take the penalties. You take the penalties. You are supposed to take the penalty. So explaining and being intense about, hey, don't fuck around. This game wasn't over. You're supposed to be taking the penalties. And then invariably, of course, Rodrigo does score the goal late that um, makes it nervy and ends up only being a 2-1. Had City ended up drawing that game and losing the title because of it, bah, 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 then we'd have a bigger problem. But uh, I think Pep is so intense and so about small details. He's not going to let the team lose because of somebody being nice. And Erling Holland, while ruthless and loves to score goals, he's also a nice guy who wants his captain, who's probably going to leave the club to get his first hat trick of his career. So uh, a little bit tricky, a little bit of a minor controversy. No big deal, really. The, the talk shows like Talk Sport made it into a thing because what else are they going to fucking talk about? <laughs> uh, I personally didn't have a problem with it. This is one of those classics where uh, the result creates a narrative. If he makes the penalty, it's no big deal. But because he missed, it became uh, a, a to-do about this or that or whatever. So I'm less interested in that and more interested in, um, you know, cities rolling on, getting it done, staying one point clear with a game in hand, still to make up that game versus Brighton in the weekend before the final weekend of the season in midweek. Just so many games, so much time. Uh, we covered Arsenal, we covered West Ham, we covered uh, Brentford versus uh, Liverpool. Um, let's go to big Frank Lampard getting it done. We are staying up, said we are staying up. Uh, less, uh, <laughs> Chelsea getting the win versus Bournemouth away. Uh, they score their three goals. Uh, they on 42. They are safe. Uh, Chelsea are not going down this season. Connor Gallagher from Chobala. Uh, bat a shield on an amazing side footed goal, and then um, uh, Sterling assisted Jao Felix on 86. The Vigna goal that Bournemouth got was the best goal of the game, just tiki taka through the Chelsea defense. Uh, Chelsea didn't play well, they got their three goals. This is what they should be doing. They should be doing, they should be scoring these goals. Uh, this game was uh, level at 1 1 until the 82nd minute, so it was not that easy. But then Chelsea did get the two goals late to seal the game. Good for Don David Brooks, the cancer survivor, to get on late in the game. So nice for him. Uh, Bournemouth are safe, but uh, this is more about Frank Lampard getting his first win. Uh, he literally told the team to have drinks on him. So that narrative of Chelsea being the worst team ever, they're now not the worst team ever. They're just shit, and their season will end with a Peter. We don't have to hear from them. We don't have to hear about Frank Lampard. They will be part of the run, and I think City plays them in a couple weeks. But uh, this is just, you know, a pathetic season that we had to actually worry about whether um, whether Chelsea would be able to beat Bournemouth away. I mean, what kind of fucking season is this? So that happened. There was that. Uh, Wolves defeated uh, Aston Villa on a goal by Neto. Nothing to write home about there. And then um, Tottenham defeat Crystal Palace 1-0 in a game the less talked about the better uh but the only thing I want to give shout out to is um Harry Kane who passes Wayne Rooney on second all time on the 
Premier League scoring list. Please keep in mind the Premier League scoring list only involves the Premier League years from 1992 forward. There are players who scored more. And we talked about Jimmy Greaves. We've talked about Dixie Dean. There's a history of English football before the Premier League. So just to keep that in mind, uh, Harry Kane on 209 goals. Now second all time passes Wayne Rooney. Um, I was, you know, I think I want to do this for Mike and sort of be really clear about Harry Kane. Harry Kane is one of the world's great strikers. And what he has to do in this um, Tottenham team is more than any other player has to do on their team. Maybe save Messi uh, in the late Barcelona years where he led the team in assists and goals. In this case, the only goal scored in this game is was set up by Kane and scored by Kane. So he's in the number 10 spot. He makes an incredible raking pass for his wingback Poro to go get. While the pass is in flight, he's trotting into the box to get to the back post because Poro then crosses it and he finishes it. So not only does Kane have to play the number 10 to play the ball out wide, he then has to be the number nine to finish it. He has to do that sort of shit all the time. He drops deep plays balls out wide, and then has to sprint into the box because there's no one who's going to get on the end of these balls. He's an incredible player. And I think like if he had a more better representation, a more ruthless streak, or just a, a selfishness that I don't think he has, he loves the club, but he could have got himself to Real Madrid years ago. He could have got himself to Manchester United. He tried to get himself to City, but he was pathetic. The idea that he signed a six-year contract with Spurs and Levy and trusted Levy to let him go when it was time was a massive mistake. And I think we're going to lose, he's going to be lost to history or lose arguments because he doesn't have enough trophies because he was loyal to Spurs. And Spurs tricked him or thought they were closer than they were and they never were. Harry Kane is an incredible player who should be lauded with your Van Nistelrooy's and your Shearer's and your Henri's. The difference is those players all have Premier League trophies and Kane not having one, not having that moment as captain of lifting a trophy is really going to hurt him. He's not going to be part of the montage of, of teams of a player lifting a trophy. And if he goes to City or Real Madrid or Bayern Munich and lifts a trophy, it's not going to mean anything because he'll have gone just to say that he did to shut people up. So he's kind of damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. He's got a um he's got a Kevin Durant quality to him in that he's an all-time great. But nobody gives him the credit that he's due because of the way he's chosen to pick out his career or I mean I don't feel like he's like Charles Barkley who made it to the finals and lost. He's more at this point, whatever he does, he's not going to be able to satisfy uh, the critics at this point. It's like, oh, leave Spurs and get a trophy, but it won't mean anything. So it would be great for him to win a trophy at Spurs. But I think if we're all honest, Spurs are further away from a trophy than they've probably been in a few years. I think they were closer under Conte's first season, but Levine always goes bargain buying instead of instead of selling Loris three seasons ago and reloading or selling a player when he had value. He didn't really get a lot for Erickson and all these things that he didn't do that have hurt um, that have hurt value and players within the world of Spurs. They never reloaded. They never had a moment where they went, we're buying a 60 million dollar goalkeeper and an 80 million dollar defender that are going to push us on and win the Premier League. They never were able to identify those linchpin players that lift you up the way Alderweireld, the way that Erickson and Kane were able to. They were never able to replace those players or solidify those players or make another pass at it. They just had the one go. That one go, and then they ran on fumes for that Champions League team. Then they Conte squeezed a little bit more, and Mourinho squeezed a little bit more, but they never were able to go further than where they were. And when you just look at Kane's numbers, especially um, in all competitions, clubs collapse, he's, he's over 25 goals a year for 10 years, which is just unheard of. 
uh, has a 40 goal season, has, has a third, has a 35, then a 40 goal season, then 24, 24, 28, 25, 28, 16 assists, 10 assists. I mean, he's just an incredible player for his career. Just always a plus on the XG, which is what all good strikers should be. He's never had a down season, never had a negative XG season. He's just an incredible player that if he goes to Manchester United, it's going to make a huge fucking difference. But seeing him in that red shirt, it's going to make me want to fucking throw up. Uh, seeing him in the red shirt of Bayern is going to make me want to throw up. Um, I just I just hate to see him have to leave like this and go to another team, but it's getting there. He's He's now 29. He's in the late prime. He's very good about keeping his body in shape. I mean, there were times there under Pochettino that he'd play too much and get kicked because he was Spurs. Uh, but now that he's where he is, I just, I just not sure what Kane should do. There are two, I'm of two minds where winning as Spurs will mean more, but I don't think they're close to winning. So you got to leave. And I don't think any Spurs fan would begrudge him leaving now. Uh, he gave his whole best seasons of his career. I mean, 10 seasons from 19 all the way to 29. I mean, what can you ask more from a player? 10 seasons, 10 years of his life, the best years of his life with the same club. He's going to be the all-time goal-scoring leader for Spurs. He, If he stays in the Premier League, he's going to break the Premier League record. He just needs that moment, lifting those tin cups. Uh, and he will be one of the greats of all time, no matter what he does, no matter what he does. Um, you know, it's just a shame he didn't start out getting that trophy the way Shearer did when he went to Blackburn and then went to Newcastle and went to two FA Cup finals, but never really did anything else. Instead, he's going to have to do it at the end where it doesn't feel as good. So uh, just just a tough, tough one for Harry Kane on that front. But I think we're all OK with him leaving at this point. Just to see where he's going to go. Um, other matches, I think that's it. I uh, do want to give some big, um, big shouts to a couple of really big games. Uh, we have the Champions League, Real Madrid, Manchester City tomorrow. <laughs> How are City going to stop Vinicius Jr.? <laughs> Is it going to be John Stones getting spun around like a fucking top? Oh, God. I know that Real Madrid haven't had a great season in La Liga, but just a cutback and seeing Karim Benzema on it, and he's just going to pop it in. And then Wednesday, uh, Inter versus, versus Milan. Those two teams are really playing for second. I don't think anyone thinks that those teams are going to win the Champions League, but it is a Derby di Italia. It is Inter Milan versus AC Milan. These are historical clubs of like the highest level. I mean, City must feel like, you know, a nouveau riche scumbags, which we are, uh, sit, going to this party. But here we are. We're here to break the party up. I think City have the right mentality. Hopefully they can go and just fucking annihilate Real Madrid. Just put five on them so I can relax. Uh, but I don't think that'll happen. And we'll just have to suffer. This is where it comes, Manny. This is where the suffering happens. Tomorrow, noon, City, Real at the Bernabeu. City haven't lost a game since February. Could this be the first one? I certainly fucking hope not. I don't want to feel this feelings. I'm petrified of this game. Uh, it's a big one. It's a massive one. Uh, I don't know how to feel. It's all coming together. It's all going to happen really fast. Uh, but let's let's do a quick summary of where we are after the relegation zone battles. Go back to the Premier League. Leicester. Oh, sorry. Let me just, uh, this isn't an updated. I got to find a more updated uh, standings list. Let's just go through the table and see where we are. Um, most teams have played 35 games, especially the ones at the bottom. We're going to start at the bottom. Uh, Southampton rooted to the spot on 24 in 20th place. They will get relegated. Leicester and Leeds both on 30 in 18th and 19th respectively. And Everton out of the relegation zone on 32. In 16th is Nottingham Forest on 33. Then West Ham on 37 and Bournemouth on 39. Wolves on 40 along with Crystal Palace. And then Chelsea taking us up into the top 10. There's a gap. Chelsea on 42. There's a six-point cap into the mid-table. The mid-table is a beautiful place filled with Fulham and Brentford in ninth and 10th, respectively. Then we have Aston Villa on 54, along with Brighton, 
on 55, but two games in hand. But they this loss really hurts them uh, in their chances for Europe, but they can get pretty far. Then Tottenham sit in sixth on 57, five points ahead of them. And fifth is the mighty Reds of Liverpool. Fuck off. They Hopefully they walk alone uh, and die a slow death. United clinging to fourth after losing two games in a week and six points to their dreaded rival Liverpool with Newcastle two points ahead of them uh, after they lose to Arsenal sitting on 65 and Arsenal on 81 getting themselves off the mat after the loss to City. City imperious having won six in a row, 10 in a row, sitting on 82 top of the league with a game on Arsenal. I don't know what's going to happen. I My going down, I think what we see here is what is going to go down. So the teams in these places, Leicester, Leeds, Southampton, those are the three I see going down. Nottingham Forest are going to stay up because I love them. That's the reason. That's literally why they're going to stay up. That's a stupid reason. Um, but who cares? Um, still so many games to go, so many miles to go. The narratives, the twists and turns, the season will end on May 28th, but I do want to go to one other place. The best games you will see. Uh, I do want to check out the EFL championship really quickly just to get a sense of the schedule of what is going to happen next. So the playoffs look like this. There is a home and away leg on Sunday, May 13th, 14th, and 16th, 17th. Sunderland, home to Luton Town, Coventry, host Middlesbrough. That's uh, Saturday and Sunday. Then the other semifinal legs will be Luton, hosting Sunderland and Middlesbrough. Then the final for who gets to go to the Premier League will be probably a week after that. And that is probably the best game you'll watch. It's at Wembley. It is fantastic. It is nerve-wracking. The Playoff final is one of the best games you can watch. Um, Middlesbrough are the class of this group, scoring lots of goals. They have um, they have the top goal scorer in the division. In um, I just want to make sure I've got got the right player. I don't want to. Is it Chupa Akbom? I'm not sure if it's Chupa Akbom, um, but they do have the top scoring player. Yes, it is Chupa Akbom. Uh, that um, that Michael Carrick transformed into a top goal scorer. He's got 28 goals. Coventry has Victor Gorkies. He's also a top goal scorer. Luton, Carlton Morris. So we'll be seeing the best players in the league, uh, the best creators. Jack Clark from Sunderland leading the league in assists and Ryan Giles also up there in assists. Just a lot of good players on display. So we will be rooting for, oh, it's tough. I want Luton. I want Sunderland. Uh, those I would take either of those two because those would be the best stories, but I think it'll be Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough, way too much talent, play attacking front foot football, but we'll find out and we'll cover it on the next show. Okay, that was the Squeaky Bum Time podcast with Laurent Cortines. We are the football wing of the Chop Sports channel and presented exclusively by the Premier Streaming Network. We record on Mondays and Thursdays, so be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast, so you never miss an episode. And if you're listening on Apple, please rate and review the show. It means everything. Thank you and good night.